Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am Zach Peterson, I am your host, and also I am a technical consultant with Altium. And today, I'm gonna go and give an answer to a question that I got during the most recent Altium Live event. Now this question deals with digital signals propagating through a grounded coplanar waveguide. So I'll give you the answer to the question now. You can put a digital signal through a grounded coplanar waveguide as long as the grounded coplanar waveguide is designed correctly. So that's what we're gonna look at today. Let's go ahead and get started. While I was at the most recent Altium Live event, someone actually asked me during a Q&A session whether or not it was possible to send a digital signal through a grounded coplanar waveguide. Now, as I was giving the answer, I mentioned that there's actually a nice paper in IEEE that actually shows a lot of data that you need to actually determine whether or not you can put a, a specific digital signal through a specific grounded coplanar waveguide. So there's a link to a blog on the Altium site in the description. Right up at the top of the blog, I put a link to that paper. You can download that paper as a PDF and check it out for yourself. And I'll actually be able to uh, explain the paper here in just a moment so that you understand what you're actually looking at in the paper because sometimes those papers can be a little bit confusing. So I'll walk you through how to analyze those results. Coplanar waveguides come in three possible varieties. So the first is where you have a trace and then you have some ground pour on the same layer, basically extending this way. And then over here, same ground pour extending this way. And then we have a specific spacing S. We have a width for our trace W. And then from here to here, we have some height above the, uh, the, the edge of the substrate. So this is kind of the simplest coplanar waveguide, meaning that you know I have my trace here that's actually carrying my signal, and then here we basically tie this to some ground net. And it's important that these two are actually tied to the same ground net. So somewhere else in the board, these two uh, pieces of copper are tied together. The next kind of uh, coplanar waveguide puts a ground plane down here. You can uh, calculate the impedance of this trace once you bring in this ground plane, just following the method that we actually showed in another video on coplanar waveguides without ground. So we actually compared those first two cases. The next type of coplanar waveguide has vias running between these two sections. So we have all of this tied to ground and it basically creates a big cage around our trace. Now as a signal propagates along the trace, essentially all of the field lines will terminate at the nearest ground region. And it's possible that this signal actually excites a resonance inside of this structure. So this kind of looks like a big resonant cavity if you think about it. You basically just have an opening here, but aside from that, everything else is closed off. And so as the designer, you need to then choose what spacing do you use. Also, you need to choose this distance, so we'll just call this uh, VL, so the length of the via away from the trace. And then if you look at this from the top, you actually have something that looks kind of like this, actually here, it looks more, more like this. So this is my trace coming down the middle. This is all of my ground pour. And then you need to choose the spacing between all of these vias. So this is called the via pitch. So, or we can just call it VP. So VP and VL are actually the values that are used in the paper that I'm gonna show here just in just a moment. These are the two parameters that, that will determine whether or not you can send a digital signal down a coplanar waveguide without there being any distortion or attenuation in the signal. Now this is really important because technically you can send a digital signal through any kind of interconnect you want as long as the interconnect is designed properly. So that includes a coplanar waveguide. Now the notion of designed properly depends on the attenuation and distortion characteristics that are created by this structure. It also depends on the bandwidth of the signal. So one of the tools that we use to quantify whether or not a signal is going to be excessively attenuated or distorted as it travels down this direction, travels down this trace, is S parameters. 
And specifically, we like to look at S21 or the insertion loss. The reason we like to look at that is because these, uh, these interconnects tend to be very long. That means losses are going to be primarily dominated by insertion loss along the length of the line. Let me just draw a graph up here so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So let's just suppose for a moment that I graph S21 versus frequency. So generally the plot is gonna do something like this. So meaning the losses are gonna get larger as the frequency goes higher. Now, depending on the location of these vias and the value of VL and VP, you may actually see some dips in this spectrum. And so these dips are related to the allowed resonances inside of this cavity. If we have a digital signal, and I'm gonna just draw it in a different color on this same graph, if we have a digital signal and its bandwidth extends all the way out to here, well, the two lossy dips in the S21 spectrum will actually cause these portions of the power that are at these frequencies to get lost extensively, and that will distort the shape of the signal. So what you really have to do is you have to look at S21, and that's what's gonna tell you whether or not you're gonna be able to, put, to send a particular digital signal down the interconnect. So just as an example, let's say we have a digital signal and the bandwidth that the receiver needs ends right here, right before this first dip. Well then, for practical purposes, the receiver is going to be able to interpret that digital signal correctly, and you don't have to worry about what, everything else that happens at higher frequencies. But let's say for a moment that the receiver needs more bandwidth Maybe it needs this much bandwidth. Well, now there's a chance that the excessive loss at these frequency ranges actually distorts the signal enough that the receiver now can't interpret this signal correctly, and then you get bit errors. So this is the tool that we have to use to figure out whether or not we can actually uh, send a digital signal down a grounded coplanar waveguide, and then whether or not the receiver will be able to interpret it correctly. So with this in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at the IEEE paper. So if you wanna follow along, like I said earlier, go to, into the description. There's a link to a blog in the description that has a link to the paper that I'm about to show. So this is the paper that I had referred to in uh, my Altium Live session. And this is the paper that has some data that you can use to actually figure out whether or not a given digital signal can reach down to the end of a grounded coplanar waveguide without excessive distortion. In this paper, they examined uh, three different structures, and these are the same three structures that I mentioned earlier. And uh, you can see here in, in uh, structure C that they've actually uh, intentionally located the, uh, the vias a bit far from the edge of the copper pore. Um, you don't have to do that yourself. I mean, if it works for your design, then that's fine, um, but that's not the only way to do it. In fact, they actually test a case where the vias are actually lined pretty close to the trace. This is the plot that you wanna look at, is the S21 plot. And there's a corresponding power loss plot. And so the power loss plot is really useful, but I prefer to look at the S21 plot. But the two, the two plots correspond to each other. So let's just go ahead and dig in. So here what they're testing is they're actually testing what happens when you change the location of the via with respect to the center of the trace. So here where my mouse is, I'm drawing it vertically. This distance from the via to the trace is VL. So what you can immediately see here is that as VL, is made larger, you actually make these dips, these high loss dips in the insertion loss spectrum correspond to lower frequencies. So you can see that all of these dips start to move to lower frequencies once you bring those vias further away from the edge of the trace. So what's going on here? Well, what you're doing is you're moving resonances down to lower frequencies. And you can see that this is actually progressive, right? So when we're at 400 microns or 0.4 millimeters, um, you can see that we practically don't really see any dips. In fact, insertion loss is really good all the way up to you know about 100 gigahertz. Um, then once we bring the vias farther away, you can see that progressively the resonances move closer and closer to lower frequency values. And 
for this uh, this uh, grounded coplanar waveguide with uh, 2.7 millimeter separation between the trace and the uh, the vias, uh, you can see that our bandwidth is basically limited to about 15 gigahertz. Is that good? Is that bad? Is that you know too much or too little bandwidth? Well, it really depends on the signal, and then, like I said earlier, it depends on the amount of bandwidth your receiver needs in order to be able to fully uh, resolve a stream of digital signals that reach the receiver. So if your particular receiver needs, let's say, uh, 24 gigahertz of bandwidth um, for this uh, particular line with 2.7 millimeter separation, um, you see these strong dips here. And unfortunately, the receiver may have uh, a hard time interpreting the signal correctly due to the presence of these dips. And you can see similar results in the corresponding power loss plot. Now, the other important parameter here is the via pitch, VP. So this is the separation uh, horizontally here where my mouse is uh, between neighboring vias. The other constraint here beyond just, you know, what bandwidth do I need is, is the manufacturability. And I'll discuss that here when I get back on the whiteboard. Um, but for the moment, we actually see similar results. So the results here are very similar, right? As we make the via separation larger, you can see that these dips in the insertion loss plot move to lower and lower frequencies. So just as a general rule, if we want to ensure that we have the uh, maximum bandwidth available for our particular interconnect, then we would like to make VP and VL as small as we possibly can. Now that's going to be subject to some manufacturability limitations. Obviously, if the uh, vias are too close together, then the hole to hole separation is too small to be reliably drilled. And then there's a risk of overlapping drill hits. And I'll discuss more with what that looks like here in just a moment. And we'll break down some of these numbers. Um, but just as a general rule, uh, what this is, what's going on here is you're actually changing the value of the resonances. And if you want to approximate the, uh, the, the cavity as um, essentially just a rectangular box, you would use a formula kind of like this. So you'd use a very similar formula to this to calculate the, what the resonances are in this structure. And essentially you can see here as you make any of these values small, uh, smaller, you make any one of these uh, F values much larger. Okay, so what we saw was we had some numbers for this value here, V sub L, and this value here, VP, uh, between the actual uh, the vias. Now, the numbers that were shown in those graphs are actually really important because, as I said, we would like to get these as close together as possible. However, due to manufacturability constraints, we can never get them too close together and that's going to depend on the uh, precision of the drilling machine that's being used, as well as the size of the via. When drilling vias, there is a whole wall to whole wall constraint, meaning this distance right here between the whole walls between these two vias has to be at least a certain value. So in the paper, what we saw was that we had about 0.35 millimeter whole wall distance that was used. Actually, it was a center to center distance, not a whole wall distance. So it was a center to center distance. And that 0.35 millimeters comes out to about 14 mils. If you really wanted to get down to 0.35 millimeters as they show in the paper, well, you have a challenge there because then you have to choose for a given drill size how close you can put these two things together. So let's just say that this drill hole has a diameter of six mils. So that would leave a whole wall to whole wall distance here for these two vias of 14 minus three minus another three gives you eight mils. So we have an eight mil whole wall to whole wall distance. So this is probably gonna be too small. A lot of fabricators will instead say we would prefer at least 10 mils. So that's the first thing to consider. And I bring up six mils because this is actually really small for a mechanically drilled via you might end up actually going a bit larger, more like 10 mils. So let's say that you did go to a 10 mil drill diameter. Let's say we have to go with 10 uh, mil distance plus 10 mil drills. We'd instead have VP equals 20 mils. Is that too big? Is that too small? Well, that comes out to an equivalent uh, distance here of 0.5 millimeters. So that's pretty close to what we had in the paper. So that's pretty good. And that's with, you know, pretty reliable manufacturing of, you know, 10 mil drills, 
plus a 10 mil spacing. So check with your fabricator before you just start putting your via pitch too close together because otherwise you're gonna ha have to go back and change it. If they see that they're too close together, they're gonna hit you with no bid status or they're just gonna tell you, hey, if you change this, we can bid for it. Same idea here with, the, uh, with this uh, distance here. So if you remember in the paper, the L was 0.4 millimeters and that's uh, basically what, like 16 mils or something. Same consideration here. If we have, let's say, five mil spacing here, which is the default that Altium Designer is gonna apply, your other your CAD tool might apply a different value, but whatever it is, if this is only five mil, that leaves an 11 mil remainder here from the wall edge to the center of the via. So let's say we again go with 10 mil vias here. Well, now this radius here is five mils. So that leaves a six mil distance between the whole wall and the edge of the copper. So is that too big? Is that too small? Well, again, they're probably gonna apply the same rule here, okay? They're gonna apply a drill to etch clearance. That drill to etch clearance may need to be more like 10 mils. So if again, if we have our, you know, five mil uh, radius here, and then we have a 10 mil requirement here, then this is actually going to increase the required size here, and it's gonna increase this distance to actually 15 mils. So instead of having a VL of 16 mils, we would actually have our VL be 20 mils. And this is what we would end up with with those drilling parameters. So keep that in mind, just because the paper says, hey, 0.4 millimeters is what we went to, doesn't necessarily mean we can manufacture it. It's gonna depend on these clearances. So again, this is one of those things, call up your fabricator, get their clearance limits, make sure that you can actually manufacture the grounded coplanar waveguide that you wanna design. All right, everybody, so hopefully this sufficiently answers the question of whether or not you can route a digital signal through a grounded coplanar waveguide. And in summary, you can subject to some conditions, and obviously you wanna make sure that those conditions that you're designing for are actually manufacturable. All right, everybody, so thanks for watching this. If you liked the video, hit that like button. If you wanna see more videos, hit that subscribe button, and definitely check out the article that we linked in the description. It has a link to the paper that describes all of this. You can keep it for yourself and use it to help you design your own grounded coplanar waveguides. All right, thanks everybody, and definitely, definitely on this, don't forget to call your fabricator.